Java is an island in what is now the country of Indonesia, colonized by the Dutch. In the early 1800s, the Dutch government gave itself a trade monopoly on several profitable cash crops. Sugar, by far, became the biggest of those cash crops. Twenty years later, the Dutch government had built a sugar empire in Java, feeding massive profits back to Holland. Only Cuba produced more sugar than Java. Just one small problem. This empire of sugar, coffee, and others was built on top of a system of forced labor and cruelty. Today, we look at the Dutch cultivation system in Java. Java is the 13th largest island in the world. Today, a stunning 151 million people live there, making it the most populous island in the world. One of the biggest cities, Jakarta, is on Java. The climate there, like with much of Southeast Asia, is hot and humid. The monsoon season brings strong rains from November to March. Otherwise, the land is very sunny. The island was formed by volcanic eruptions, and thus contains various volcanoes running from east to west. When it rains, the erosion brings ash down to the plains, making the soil incredibly fertile. This makes the island of Java a very fine place to grow crops, crops like coffee and sugar. The Dutch has had a presence in Java since the 1500s. The Dutch East India Company, or VOC, first established their capital, Batavia, in 1619. That city is now Jakarta. This massive, state-supported business, a state within a state, had a trade monopoly on goods in the area. They landed in Java and started acquiring political power to secure its supply of spices. Through the tried-and-true colonialist playbook of backing pretenders to power, the company destroyed the power of the Mataram Sultanate, the last independent Javanese native state. The Dutch Center for Sugar in Asia had originally been the island of Taiwan. In 1624, VOC established a trading center near what is now the city of Tainan. A decade later, they defeated the powerful headhunting aboriginal clans, paving the way for Han farming and hunting settlements. For a while, Taiwan was the breadbasket of the Indies. Taiwanese sugar was exported to Japan, Persia, and sometimes even back to Amsterdam. But then in 1661-1662, the ex-Ming warlord Koshinga laid siege to the Dutch fort of Zealandia and captured them. With this, the VOC lost Taiwan and its sugar plantations, leaving them without a significant source of sugar. For several decades, they tried growing sugar on the island of Mauritius off the coast of Africa. The settlers suffered a battery of challenges including pests, disease, and cyclones, not to mention unrest from the slave labor force. Discouraged, the Dutch pulled out from Mauritius in 1710, but not before killing off the dodo. Sad. The Chinese first brought sugar production to Java in the early 1600s. China was a pioneer in sugar production and refinement, having apparently first picked it up from Indian traders in the 600s. Chinese traders and entrepreneurs then brought their sugar to Java, where it was grown and sold for domestic use. By the early 1800s, the Chinese ran a series of plantations and processing factories near the sugarcane farms. This is because the harvested sugarcane has to be processed near where it is grown, like 24 to 48 hours after harvest. The sucrose inside the cane decays quickly. The Chinese imported specialized wooden equipment tools from their homeland to handle this processing. After cutting the cane, you press it in order to squeeze out the juice a labor-intensive process operated by two water buffaloes. After then, you heat up the juice to boil off the water and thicken the sugar juice into a syrup. The Chinese sugar boilers carefully modify the heat to facilitate the creation of sugar crystals within this syrup. The crystals are then taken out of the syrup in a process called tapping out. We put the syrup into upside-down cones and cover the tops of those cones with wet clay. After a few days, we open the bottom and let the syrup run off. The remaining sugar crystals are classified by their color. The layers of sugar right underneath the dry clay often turn white and is considered the best. Deeper down, the sugar turns dark. This is not as valuable. The remaining syrup is sold as molasses. The crystals are recooked, pounded into powder, and sold. Chinese immigrants largely ran this process and did the skilled labor funded by either the VOC or the government. In terms of manual labor, a plantation had about 150 to 200 workers and recruited from the North Coast, since Batavia in the early 1800s was pretty sparse. Growing without restraints or checks from the government, the VOC grew corrupt and cruel. 
Their fall took decades and is beyond the scope of this video. Nevertheless, it did fall into bankruptcy, and the Dutch government eventually nationalized it in 1799. With the trade monopoly abolished, an opportunity for sugar came when prices rose due to a slave revolt in 1791 in what is now modern Haiti. Chinese and European entrepreneurs expanded their production of sugar. In 1816, the extent of Dutch holdings in Java was basically a few port cities in Batavia plus the sugar plantation surrounding that city. But after taking direct control, the Dutch government continued the VOC's conquest of the Javanese lands. There was a brief lapse starting in 1811 when the British, led by Stamford Raffles, took over Java for five years and tried to establish land taxes, elected village governments, and free trade. But per the Convention of London in 1814, the British quote-unquote returned Java to the Netherlands. By then, the Chinese-run sugar plantation industry in Java was at the end of its rope. These Chinese sugar processors required a large workforce of animals, took a long time to make their sugar, and the cooking process also used a lot of sparse firewood. By the late 1700s, they had stripped the surrounding Batavia lands of its forests. Real talk, the Chinese entrepreneurs did not like the sugar business. It meant managing large workforces of animals and people, sugar prices fluctuated wildly, and the Dutch were seemingly always cheating them. The end of the Napoleonic Wars in the 1820s reopened trade with the global colonies, with the production of goods like sugar rapidly scaling up. But overproduction caused global sugar prices to crash, and the Chinese sugar plantation owners found themselves financially ruined. Sugar production fell so low that Java was actually importing their sugar. This economic misery was abetted by war, the Java War. In 1823, a massive uprising broke out against Dutch rule. The uprising was led by Prince Diponogoro, who first rebelled against the Dutch for not recognizing his own position in the royal hierarchy. But the conflict tapped very popular sentiments of anti-European discontent, including growing influence in Javan domestic affairs. The fighting was bitter. The Dutch estimated that 2 million Javans, 80% of the whole population, were affected by the war. Some 200,000 Javanese and 15,000 on the Dutch side, including 8,000 Europeans, perished. Diponogoro enjoyed lasting support from the people who funded his guerrilla campaigns. He styled himself a long-awaited, quote, just king, end quote, who would free the ordinary people from oppression, a millenarian. In response, the Dutch executed a long anti-guerrilla action involving a series of fortifications to restrict the fighters' movements and sap their local support. The tactic reminds me of what the British did with the blockhouses many years later during the Second Boer War. Then finally in 1830, Diponogoro was captured by the Dutch during negotiations for surrender. Dutch writings indicate that they felt that he wasn't acting on good faith. Javan writings indicate that he was dishonorably betrayed. However it happened, he was banished away from the island, finally ending the war. The Java War forever changed Indonesian history, like how the Indian Rebellion of 1857 changed the British colonization of India. That same year, 1830, the southern provinces of the United Kingdom of the Netherlands successfully won their independence, creating what is now the country of Belgium. The Belgian Revolution tore away the profitable Flemish textile mills from the Dutch government, so the Dutch no longer had the money to subsidize his Dutch East Indies colonies. With the colony's finances drained by war and the home government unable to help, the newly appointed Dutch Governor General Johannes van den Bosch instituted the cultivation system to raise government revenue. The cultivation system worked like this. The Javanese natives are obligated to devote a portion of their lands and labor to growing certain cash crops like rice, coffee, and sugar. Legally, that portion was set at about 20% of a community's land. In practice, the portion was everything that the village natives can possibly bear. The crops are harvested by laborers who then sold their product to a semi-governmental trade monopoly called the Netherlands Trading Society. Theoretically, they receive wages, but it's not clear how much of these wages reach them, thanks to deducted land taxes and third parties skimming off the top. Private entrepreneurs, at first the Chinese and later Europeans, helped process the sugar. They found this work extremely profitable, especially in the early years. 
The trading society would then export and sell the finished goods on an open market back in Europe, earning a very handsome margin. Sugar was not the only thing grown under the system. For instance, coffee was grown in the highlands, and 14 of the 21 residencies in Java were uninvolved in sugar. But sugar quickly overtook coffee in the 1850s, and it became the most profitable cash crop. Sugar's growth was abetted by new technologies and social systems. Most notably, the Dutch government in 1835 invited a British mill owner, surnamed Eddie, to introduce steam power and his vacuum pan to the factories. Vacuum pan simplified sugar processing by reducing the pressure, making it easier to purify the syrup. The British also brought steam-powered metal cylinders to crush cane. Each of Java's 95 factories had these systems by 1877. Like with many plantations, the cultivation system was not built on top of advanced technology or automation, but cheap land and labor, or to put it more realistically, forced labor. The government Batavia set targets that devolved to local colonial officials, who then passed them to regional elites who in turn passed them down to the village heads. The village heads offered up conscripts for the harvesting and factories. The system was very lightly regulated. The Dutch Department of Colonies had just 67 employees. So ultimately, the cultivation system was administered by regional elite Javans who were most often incentivized not by explicit military coercion, though it was certainly there, but money. The Dutch issued financial kickbacks to the village heads based on how much their conscripts harvested and processed. Theoretically, these kickbacks were to be distributed to the actual workers, but the elites were allowed to do whatever they pleased with the money. Some of these regional head elites near the top of the system, called the Bupati or regents, earned legendary wealth. Each of the five regents and Pranagan, an area in West Java, earned 250 times what in median labor did. To compare, in 2022, the average CEO of an S&P 500 company earned 272 times what their median workers did, according to Reuters. The village heads, or chiefs, were key to the whole process. To retain power, the Dutch intervened in how those chiefs were selected. Previously, chiefs were communally selected and served for a limited period. The Dutch backed specific village heads amenable to their ways and left them in power for longer. By the 1860s, over 2.5 million Javans were involved in the island's sugar industry. Most often, a household in the village had to send its male head though replacements and bribes can be offered. We have little information about the work conditions during these times, but it was no walk in the park. Hygienic conditions on the plantations were very poor. Workers were housed in squalid enclosures called kampongs in groups of one or two thousand. Such tight conditions frequently caused problems. Or they had to commute, walking up to ten miles a day back and forth. They worked eight days straight and then went home for one to eight days before returning. The plantation owners did not provide much food to their workers, especially during the 1830s in the early days of the system, and many workers went hungry or worse. Low wages garnished by land taxes and native elites did not help. Malnourishment, overwork, and unclean conditions caused laborers to die from local epidemics in large numbers. Typhoid fever, cholera, and dysentery alone killed up to 4% of unskilled laborers. A fascinating demographic study in 2021 reviewed crude death rates for laborers and non-laborers at the time. They determined that the cultivation system, with its forced labor and bad conditions, raised mortality rates in the native population by 10 to 30 percent. The cruel genius of the Dutch system was that it stepped right into traditional power structures, restructuring them whenever needed for their own benefit. Village peasants had long been obliged to perform labor tribute for their regional elites and village heads without pay and under the threat of violence. The Dutch turned these tribute relationships into efficient labor gangs for their system. At the system's peak in the 1850s, sugar and coffee produced vast profits for the Dutch government. Net transfers of the government provided 30 to 50 percent of all its revenue and amounted to 4 percent of the entire Dutch GDP. To compare, transfers to the UK from their colonies in India in the 1880s were worth just 2% of British GDP. To add, that number included profits generated by private industry in India, and thus not the government's. All the profits extracted from Java flowed directly to the administration. 
Amsterdam and the colonial governments of the Dutch East Indies were funded by the forced labor of the peasants. As early as 1848 reports about the cruelty of the cultivation system started to emerge, W. M. Baron Van Hovel was a Dutch minister who frequently criticized the colonial system. After helping to organize a large uprising in the 1840s, he was subsequently evicted. But back home, he became a ferocious critic of the cultivation system. As word got to Holland, questions of slavery and colonialism circulated through society. It was doubly uncomfortable when the Dutch government itself was earning so much money on the back of this exploitive system. A major book published in 1860 called Max Havilar, or The Coffee Auctions of the Dutch Trading Company, by the Dutch writer named Multatuli, widely publicized the cruelties of the Dutch colonial system, raising awareness that their wealth came as a result of suffering abroad. Slowly, throughout the 1860s, the home government phased out parts of the cultivation system on a per-crop basis. First pepper, then indigo, tea, and cinnamon. Sugar and coffee were last to go. In some areas, cultivation-era contracts for coffee were still being delivered to warehouses into the 1910s. The end of the cultivation system shifted the sugar industry away from government control to free enterprise. Private entrepreneurs were given more control of the sugar industry's operations. They started paying wages, cleaned up their kampongs, and temporarily leased rice fields from the villages to grow cane. This change gave the chiefs even more power. They were the ones helping to negotiate the land leases, and more abuses happened. Peasants unwilling to lease out their land were coerced into doing so, setting fire to their fields as a last-ditch measure of protest. Many sugar plantations were then wiped out in the 1880s thanks to fierce market competition from sugar beets in Europe. But the sugar industry recovered from the crash and grew to become very successful. After the Great Depression, however, sugar prices fell when countries put strong protections on their markets. In an attempt to stabilize prices, an international consortium of sugar providers set up what is called the Chadborn Plan, imposing export quotas on themselves. Unfortunately, the Chadborn Plan did not go as planned. Java sugar production fell to new lows in the 1930s. Production recovered just a bit in 1941, just in time for the Japanese invasion and occupation in 1942. This ended the Javanese sugar empire for good. The cultivation system enriched the Dutch in the first half of the 1800s, and its impact continues to be felt in Indonesia to this day. Because sugarcane has to be processed so quickly, factories were built in Java's heartlands, so the Dutch also had to build roads, water wheels, and ports for those factories, essential infrastructure for economic growth. This investment was originally done to exploit the sugar, but it helped the Javanese after the Dutch left. An interesting economic history paper from MIT in 2018 finds that areas hosting cane factories during that era are today more industrialized and educated than areas without factories. It adds an intriguing angle to the Dutch colonial story in Indonesia. Nevertheless, the cultivation system was one of the most extractive colonial systems to have ever existed, and it is a stain on those who propagated it. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, like this video and all, and I'll see you guys next time.